All right, we have folks signing on. I'm just gonna give it another minute as people are joining us and we should be streaming live to Facebook now as well. And as we are waiting for just that one minute, I'll invite folks, if you want to share in the chat, what is a food that you are currently craving? And do you have the ability to access it? Got Brussels sprouts showed up in the chat, pizza, Nutella, peanut butter ice cream, Thai food. Dolmas, crepe cake, crepe cake. That sounds good. I just made crepes the other day, but I didn't know you could make crepes into cake. A meatball parm sandwich. Seeing a lot of really excellent, delicious choices. I'm very excited about all of them. Rice and lentils, coconut milk ice cream bar. Yeah, a lot of excellent things. Thai dumplings with green curry sauce. I make my own green curry paste. Zeno's Ethiopian, Molly, I approve. Uh, those of you who know me and are familiar with me know that Ethiopian food is my favorite. And anytime anyone mentions anything related to Ethiopian food, I am instantly intrigued and wish to participate. All right. I believe we are reaching our critical mass. Um, please feel free to keep sharing about your food and to keep chatting in the chat box throughout our time together this evening. I'm really glad to welcome you here tonight to the next installment in the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Networks Liberating Webinar Series. My name is Lydia XZ Brown. My pronouns are they, them. I am a youngish East Asian person with short, black and teal hair, although I need to put more color in the teal soon. I'm wearing glasses, I'm one of my favorite shirts, it says decolonize your syllabus. And behind me is a fake background that shows a pretty glass building and trees with lights on them. So we can pretend that their lights for Diwali or Christmas or whatever you want the lights to be for, we'll just pretend. I know that we're not close to any of those holidays. So like, again, pretending. Um, I am AWN's director, of policy, advocacy, and external affairs. And tonight I am really excited to present to you what I hope will be an exciting, amazing conversation with three fantastic writers and disabled scholar activists on crip cultural work, being disabled and writing literature. I want to pause for just a moment to let folks know that we have current captioning available. If you click the CC button at the bottom of your screen, an option will appear that you can view the subtitles um, as embedded into the Zoom. You can open them as the full sidebar, or you can pop them out as a little pop-up window. You can also access the captioning in a separate window in your browser if you prefer to have them open in that way instead. Uh, we have an American Sign Language interpreter on screen. And if at any point you're having trouble with access, please let us know. Uh, we are trying to do our best to attend to access, uh, especially around language and communication. and um, we will, you know, always be seeking ways to improve upon the ways in which uh, we are addressing communication and language access and justice, because that is a critical component of disability justice work. Um, tonight, I am really excited to introduce to you our three fantastic, amazing guests, two of whose writing I was familiar with before tonight, and the third of whom I learned about in collaboration with our Education and Programs Assistant, Nancy Yang, who helps to organize all of these webinars. So our first guest is Saray Jarrell Johnson, a poet and writer from Piscataway, New Jersey. His work has appeared in the New York Times, Boston Review, Vice, and Art News, among other publications. He earned an MFA in creative writing from Columbia University. Slingshot, his first collection of poetry, won a 2020 Lambda Literary Award in Gay Poetry, which for those who don't know, is a big fucking deal. And Slingshot is available now from Night Boat Books. Saray was a 2020 Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sergeant Rosenberg 
Poetry Fellow and the inaugural Brooklyn Public Library Poet in Residence. Next, I would like to introduce to you T.S. Banks. T.S. Banks is a Black and QT disabled, which means queer and trans and disabled, non-binary teaching artist, poet, and playwright from Madison, Wisconsin, a town that sadly has only one Ethiopian restaurant. Only one. He is the founder of Loud and Unchained Theater Co. And they are also co-founder of Sweetwater Liberation Lab. Zero work addresses visioning for black liberation, a critique of the medical system, radical care and access, madness, queer and trans liberation, disability justice, abolition, and cross-movement solidarity. All the same things I deeply care about. Why are we not friends already? We're friends now, right? Can we be friends? I want to be friends. It's like all the same things I care about. Thank you for joining us, T. And last, but absolutely not least, we have the cyborg Jillian Wise. But sorry, I pronounced that wrong. The cyborg Jillian Weisse, correctly pronouncing with German pronunciation. I remember, I remember. And size books include The Amputee's Guide to Sex, published in 2007 and again in 2017, the novel The Colony in 2010, The Book of Goodbyes, 2013, Cyborg Detective, 2019. That is sitting in a pile that I need to read. It's right there. It's on the shelf of, you don't see, of books that I promised I was reading in the last six months and did not finish reading yet. And that is it on screen. It's got a fantastic cover. And the chat book, Give It to Alfie Tonight, 2020. Sai started Borg for Borg Productions and directed a Kim Deal party. Sai's memoir is forthcoming from Echo. I am so excited for all of you to be here and in conversation with each other and with the folks who are here tonight. Our first question, without repeating what I just totally read off of Google Docs, can you tell us about your work without repeating what I just said? What are some of the forms or mediums that you work in, that you're writing in? Tell us about your process, about what you bring to your art, what it means to you. And to kick us off, I'm going to turn it over to T. <laughs> wow. Um, well, first off, I just want to say that this is an incredible honor to um, share this virtual space with y'all today. I really look up to the work you have put into this world, all of y'all. So I just want to put that there. Uh, let's see. Well, like you said, I'm the founder of Loud and Unchained Theater Co., which um, is a collective of um, Black, disabled, queer, trans, non-binary um, artists, um, mostly from Madison and some from around the U.S. And um, I would say, well, I identify as a poet and a teaching artist and a playwright. And Mm, spoken word is probably like my medium. Um, I would say high school is when I really decided to, mm, I guess, get on stage and share from my experiences. Um, my spoken word, like poetry, I try to like adapt for the page. Um, and that's been really fun with my previous like chat books. I have a forthcoming um, third longer book of poems called Split, and it'll be released um, June 30th at um, a local bookstore here in Madison called A Room of One's Own. And um, like I said, like my work really addresses being like a psych survivor and um, surviving the psych um, and, um, medical industrial complex, especially um, living in my body mind, um, being mad, um, being very tall, um, being fat, right? Um, uh, queer and non-binary. And I really just use 
um, poetry and um, playwriting as a medium to like, you know, talk about my experiences, but also to like connect to other mad folks because um, I found it really isolating. Um, and poetry is, a, uh, I think, um, probably the most accessible medium to me to be able to connect um, uh, with other folks like me. So th thank you. Thank you so much, T. And like, I am here for all things psych survivorship. Um, doing a webinar, I think next week with Fireweed Project and really excited about it. Yeah. Talk a lot more about food. So, you know, stay tuned if you're like intrigued by this food conversation. Um, Saray, I'll turn to you next. I'm just gonna put you all in the hot seat one at a time, it's fine. They're fine. Um, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it's great to be here with all of you. It is a huge honor and an exciting time to hear about all of your work. Um, what will I say about my own? Good question, Saray. Um, I am a poet and I have been a poet for my whole life. Um, I'm a formalist, um, which means that I write in poetic form. I care a lot about poetic form. I care about making it. I care about breaking it. Um, and I think that there is an importance um, in it to this day. And um, part of that importance is that form is pleasurable. I care a lot about having fun. I care a lot about pleasure. And um, one of the reasons that people write in form is because it is pleasurable. Rhyme is pleasurable. Structure is pleasurable. It allows people to control their experience. But form is also the body. Um, and so it allows me as a medium to talk about the body without having to talk about the body. Um, I think that I learned, so I grew up reciting poetry competitively through a free program at my church called the New Jersey Orators. Um, and so I learned poetry through the mouth. And it was mostly like old people poetry, right? Which is not an insult at all, but like it was like, you know, Langston Hughes and Gwendolyn Brooks and Nikki Giovanni and people like that. And they rhyme, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they, they cared about rhyme. Um, you know, County Cullen cared about form. I mean, he wrote so many sonnets. Um, and I think that there is a reason for that. And it isn't just legitimacy. It's not just, you know, kowtowing or copping to some sort of inherited form. It's both, um, a claim for that kind of pleasure, that built-in pleasure, and also a subversion um, of traditionally white forms. And, um, but I think that uh, form can do other things too. Like I think about Tyhemba Jess's Olio um, and what it does with counterpuntals or the golden shovel, right? Um, we can't let white people uh, take credit for things that they only do half well. That being said, um, I'm also a prose writer. I'm working on a um, full length manuscript at this time. So please um, keep me in your thoughts and prayers. Um, and my second book, Watch Night, just got picked up by my publisher. So I'm excited about that. And that should be out um, either fall 2023 or, or winter 2024. Congratulations. That is exciting news. I'm like, uh, you're gonna send us all the link, right? Like you have to, you have to promise now. You're getting a lot of congrats in the chat too. I hope you know that. Um, Sai. Yes, hi everyone. I am a white cyborg. Uh, cyborg means that I walk with a computerized leg and it's not a fake leg, it's a, my leg. I'm in an office. I have like some frames on the wall. Khadijah Queen is in one of them and um, a lamp in the background. And I'm wearing a black dress. It's very professional because I just finished teaching. I'm really aware of how Zoom erases my disability visually. So I want to actually disclose it. Um, I have scoliosis, so I lean to, a, to the side and I didn't know until very recently that I could also have a um, mental disability. I thought I had to only be physically disabled. So I'm a cyborg augmenting with Norco, um, Lexapro and Clonopin. And I mentioned the pharmaceuticals as a way to destigmatize prescriptions. Um, 
I'm thrilled to be here. I'm honored to be here with my fellow co-panelists and folks in the audience. I'm grateful to Nancy Yang and Lydia for getting us together in the same space. And I am working on uh, an essay that was assigned to me. And the assignment was, what is reality? And I thought that was a way too big a topic but somehow it's coming together. So that's what I'm working on. Thank you so much. Sorry, go ahead, sorry. And uh, do my image description. Sorry about that. Thank you for that um, reminder, uh, Sai. Um, hi, I'm Saray. I'm black, I'm light-skinned and I'm wearing little glasses that have cat eyes. Um, I have locks down to, I guess about my shoulders now. Okay, come on, hang time. Um, and uh, I'm wearing a black shirt um, in my background are boxes because I am moving um, and the top of a vacuum cleaner, the top of a um, cat box made up to look like a house plant and also a whiteboard cork board combination. Oh, should I get mine too? Okay. Hi, y'all. Um, my name is Tia Thanks, um, and I am a dark skin, um, black and fat uh, disabled person with black frame glasses and mid length uh, locks with gold tips. In the back of me is my LNU um, Theater Co. Uh, um, logo, um, and it is in pink and blue, and there is a trans um, pride flag right next to me, honey, okay, and it is blue, pink, and white, um, and I have, I have on, well, I try to carry the trans flag wherever I go, like on me, a remix of it, so I got a remix of it as a hoodie um, that's mostly pink and tie-dyed with blue. Thank you. Uh, I love that remix description. This is Lydia. Uh, I'm 100% here for all of the insert pride, especially trans pride into everything. Um, I wanna ask if each of you would be willing to share a little bit about your current project. You all mentioned what it is. Can you share a little bit more or maybe even tease us with an excerpt? Anyone? Or I'll start calling names. Sure, yeah. Um, so Slingshot, my first book, was the first part of a trilogy. And um, Watch Night, the book that I just finished and sent to my publisher, um, is the second in a trilogy. Um, and so it's a book of poetry that really just deals with um, difficulties in memory um, and through like serial poetry um, and the story of these lovers that I started in the first one. So. This is one of the lyric poems that um, comes from Watch Night. It's called Autistic Heaven. Autistic Heaven has room for every autistic and rooms for many autistics to ramble, wander, wonder aloud at amusing that would be bore those left on their earth. Those who sent us through the gaps in creation. A bowl of earplugs by each door. Reliable headphones that don't pinch the cartilage. There shouldn't be so many children here, but when the rest arrive, we sit on the floor until they're cried out and their bruises, the bruises they arrived with dry up. They take a deep breath and learn to play the inside of a washing machine. Xylophone reinvented like voila, because what would you do without us? Anyways, the new thing we send down sounds like a bell and a drum dinging in circles in the hands of the savant band. You're welcome. Here we go pushing it through the veil in the brain of a recycled soul. Another little one stacks boxes in boxes on boxes to make her own tower. We have a buttered spaghetti party in the tower. I tell her no one can ever kill her again. She is the genius the world requires to continue. It was their loss. Wow. Thank you. Sai or tea. 
I, I, can't, I cannot share what is reality because I don't know yet. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm in it. I'm in the thick of it. Um, I'm going to share instead something from Poetry Magazine that was published in February. But I want to say that it was an eight person, all disabled and deaf collaboration. And possibly the first time we got rappers in Poetry Magazine. I'm really grateful that Tiny Jag out of Detroit and A.D. Carson out of, um, I'm having brain fog, Virginia, um, contributed songs to the video sonnets. And I'm grateful to Haben Gurma who came on board as a disability justice consultant and at the last minute told me that my uh, image descriptions, which are the poems in poetry were not sufficient and that I needed a descriptive transcript for the video sonnets as well. So it was like a, a, a whole learning process. And um, Nancy, I don't know if you can drop the link to uh, it in the chat. I'm, I'm not fast right now because I got chronic pain going on, but um, I'm going to read a poem called Romantic Gesture, where I'm trying to figure out, based on the knowledge of my blind crip friends, like Constance Merritt, John Lee Clark, um, a lot of other blind folks, like how to make a poem that is the video that is like all access, okay? Romantic gesture. Begin, a gold box with a bow, how nice. And two, some are ivory, some are stone. And three, stiletto boots with black buttons. And four, this necklace is, this music is, Bump, 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 and five. Andy says hi. He'll stop by after he films these people kissing for three minutes. He wants to know if we have any blow. And six, take this, black glove and implement. And seven, of course you are. How nice. A water fountain sprung and eight, poor thing, it doesn't fit. So I don't want to wear it. And even if it did. Thank you for sharing that. And please um, do keep telling us if you remember later after tonight, where we, else we can go to get copies of that issue or any other place where your work is. And, um, Nancy will email everybody all those links. It's so. in the chat. So thank you, oh. Nancy. Yeah. But any further links, any further uh, publications, you know, we, we want to promote you. We want to promote your work, all of you. Um, T? Thank you. Oh, it's been a joy to hear the work so far. Um, uh, right now, I'm currently working on my third collection of poems called Split, which will be released June 30th um, at a local um, queer bookstore here in Madison called A Room of One's Own. Thank you. I'm so excited about it. And Split. Um, okay, so the name is I go more into it in the book, but the split is based off of the names and labels that were given to me um, in my madness. Um, and split really talks about how grief, um, pain, mm, spiritual harm, like split my mind open. So, um, and other stuff. So anyway, um, I want to say care warning because I'm about to read a poem from um, Split and it's called The Body Keeps the Score. Um, and yes, I know that's the name of a book right now. And the <laughs> the author is um, escaping me. OK, but that um, that book changed my life. OK, um, but The Body Keeps the Score. Um, and um, also care warning, um, trauma and sexual assault. 
So I support you if you need to take care of yourself. Okay. The body keeps the score. Even in the crevices, when the dirt piles up, in between the cake sleep, care for myself is hard. One time I looked and eight weeks passed before I put my body underwater. I think it's cause I'm always drowning or maybe it has to do with the times I couldn't tell if someone would enter the shower, if someone would open the door. A lot of things happened in the bathroom, blood in the water, scrubs that felt less than gentle intrusive hands. When the water is running, I am most scared. Shower with the curtain open, run water 20 seconds, lather, scrub, rinse 30 seconds in the shower. I look for the places shadows hide and lights reflect. Creeping feet are silent. Creeping hands usually don't make sounds, but a body always carries a shadow. I've been looking for shadows in the way light bends for years. When objects is submerged underwater, the light bends, the reflection water is an uncertain place for a body like like mine, water has always signaled a fight or marks the water graves where the bodies escape. Water also feeds the flowers, cleans the wounds, refreshes the spirit complex like me to quench thirst and to harm. Water, nurturer, suffocating like a lover or a parent. Water, harm and life. Water, a passage and well, a wet valley of mountains sometimes. When my skin is submerged under the shower's water, I breathe. Thank you. Wow. I just want to listen to all of your writing like all night, but also we can't do that. Eventually the captioner and the interpreters are going home and we all need to go to bed at some point, but wow, thank you. Thank you to all of you. I'm wondering, you know, um, if you could each speak a little bit, you know, more specifically about how disability and madness and illness influence and shape your art um, or what the relationship is for you between disability and madness and illness and your art. Um, and for this one, let's start with Sai. Oh, um, I guess the way that disability and madness shape my art is uh, a big shift from when I first wrote uh, The Amputee's Guide to Sex for a non-disabled audience and then uh, realized I didn't care about that non-disabled audience and that, um, well, I just got radicalized. I got radicalized and started thinking about my ideal audience differently. And that was changed. That was, that was transformative for me. So I'm queer. I'm polyamorous. I'm a dominant. I'm disabled. I mean, I have all these identities and I kept making, thinking I needed to appeal to some sort of general audience. And then I, slowly realized that was not fun for me to kind of go back to something one of you said, like the pleasure of it, the fun of it. I think it was you, Sari, the, the desire part of formalism. Um, yeah. So now I, I write for specifically for disabled, crip, uh, cyborg, people and if non-disabled people like it that's fine but they're no longer the center of who I'm thinking of this is Lydia I really appreciate that decentering just non-disabled people specifically um T could you repeat the question yeah, can you talk about the relationship between disability, madness, and illness and your work, how it shows up in your art? Ooh, okay. I'm going to try to make this short. Um, so Loud and Unchained Theater Co., or I go for short, LNU, 
is adapted from the name of one of my, well, my second play um, that I showed, which um, how I came up with LNU was I was going to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And at the time I had a full ride scholarship through the first wave program. And there's these um, festivals every year called the Line Breaks Festival. And they just so happen to pick me out of all the line breakers, right? Um, or first waivers to show this work. And this work was basically me, me and my partner and other friends and professors that would visit me while I was ill. Um, like literally not here, dissociating, either going through mania or psychoses. And um, sometimes, um, and so I would talk in this pressured speech and really fast. Um, and it just so happened that one of my friends early on said it sounded like poetry. So I kept a recorder with me and things and cameras around me to record some of these things, right? And giving my closest people um, permission to do that. And one day I transcribed all of those things and it ended up being a couple of plays, Loud and Unchained and Loud and Unchained Spiritual, which is a poetic pr transcription of, yeah, when I'm in the middle of mania. Um, and I when I put that on stage, it was life-changing because I did it. I literally did it because at first, I think, like Sai was saying, I think I was trying to inform other folks about how hard it was for a body like mine, a body mind like me to survive the psych industrial complex, like what was happening to me, how they didn't believe me, how they over-medicated me, um, how they incarcerated me, um, you know, how they institutionalized me. And um, then I realized afterwards there was a, uh, you know, um, sorry, words are escaping me. I'm coming back from a migraine. So it's a lot of words I'm trying to um, grab onto. Um, um afterwards was a talk um a, a talk back and there um was so many other folks who identified as mad sick and ill and I knew from that day forward that I wasn't alone in this um that we could hold each other um we we went past the time and then uh, some of us went out to eat afterwards and we were slow some of us were crips some of us had words that we couldn't catch up to there were tears there was laughter and there was a whole bunch of fucking rage you know what i'm saying and um anyway we shared that time um, together and I knew from then that I had to center my work in this way of just telling it raw and straight, no matter how hard it is, but safely um, for me. And um, so, yeah, I think that's how it intersects um, for me. Thank you. And, you know, we will absolutely be sending out the links to Loud and Unchained uh, again when we email everybody. Uh, Saray. Yeah, I don't think I center anyone in my work. I think that like I'm really mostly writing through experiences that I can't resolve. And I'm also looking to trace an arc of what it means to be close to someone else. And so disability and all of my other identities and all of my other experiences um, come up in those ways. But I also think that like while I'm very publicly disabled and like, you know, I work in disability justice and things like that. I do, I am really influenced by my community of origin in the way that I talk about disability or don't talk about disability. Um, I think that, you know, growing up, I got sick very early. Um, you know, I was diagnosed with autism as a child, but um, I got sick with lupus pretty early in my life. Like I was about 14 years old. And my grandmother, who's also disabled or who was also disabled, she has passed away now. Um, she was always very worried about people seeing that I was disabled and preying upon me. And I mean, that was a very valid fear. <laughs> this is a very valid fear. Um, and, you know, that informs my work um, and informs the way that my work approaches disability. Um, I think that the disability that's most like primary, I guess, in my work is PTSD. 
Um, there's always something about autism in there, but I do think that writing about lupus, it's, I know it's an unpopular opinion, but it can be unsatisfying to write about the body in my opinion, because the body is so literal, it's so rote that like anything that I can say about the body, it almost feels inadequate to me. Like when I put down, like I am feeling in great pain, like there's just like no way to make someone comprehend that pain, which is why I'm a formalist. Because, you know, when you elide a rhyme or when you break a rhyme in a way that's unexpected or unpleasant, it's painful. It's, it's unpleasant. Um, and it approximates that unpleasantness without having to try to explain that unpleasantness. So I think that my primary relationship to um, disability in my work is a relationship between pleasure and displeasure, alien, between an alienation and an invitation, um, between pleasure and pain. This is Lydia. Um, I don't know like how much I've talked about this with you all, but um, I also write, although I haven't published very widely, um, my literature, um, I've not published. I've published like two poems and two short stories. No, one poem and two short stories. I had to think about that. I really had to think about that. But, you know, I um, talk to my friends a lot about my writing too. And like these kinds of themes come up in conversation where people um, in my life, right, will often just assume, oh, so you must be writing in your fictional writing and in your poetry about the very same things that you write about in your activism, your advocacy. And that's true, but it's not true at the same time. Like what I write when I'm creating art um, isn't meant for the same purpose is what I write when I'm writing in an advocacy context, even though who I am and what I've experienced and what's happening in my communities, of course, always informs and is informed by um, what, I'm, what I'm writing and what I'm creating too. I'm wondering if each of you could talk a little bit about um, who your favorite disabled cultural workers and writers are. Who would you suggest that people look to to deepen and broaden their horizons, to engage with crip literature, to um, read more of the kinds of work that you are all creating. And I'll go right back to you, Sari, this time. Well, um, I definitely write after uh, Leah Lakshmi, P.F. Sinesh Marasingha, like that is, um, you know, my writing would not be if it were not for their writing. Um, I found the Femme Shark Manifesto when I was gosh, 16 years old. And I was like, oh, like someone wants to write about the things that I care about. Like somebody wants to write like, you know, like radical femme poetry um, and scenes and stuff. And it like really opened up my life. Like I can't pretend it didn't. Um, I've always been a big fan of Audre Lorde. Audre Lorde's letters to Pat Parker, um, you know, are life-changing. Like just watching like two people like in the midst of like going through like cancer and you know, Audrey, like class stuff comes up so much about like the difference between being disabled in middle class as I am and being disabled in working class, um, which I was. <laughs> and so um, I think that there's so much there. Um, who else? Um, I really love how Octavia Butler writes about um, disability. I think that there's some creepy things about Octavia Butler that people gloss over a lot um, or like about her work that sometimes takes me out of it. But um, I definitely love the way that Octavia Butler writes about disability specifically. Um, and disability, um, like uh, I would say like somatic disabilities and like systemic disabilities in a way that it's, it can be really difficult to write about. Um, I love Constant Merit, uh, Constance Merit, I love um, Eli Clare's work. Um, I could probably go on, but I'll leave it there. Absolutely love Leah Lakshmi, Pyepshna Samara Singh's work. Um, also really deeply influential. Um, Sai, I'll, I'll move back to you. Okay, I, um, this past year, the disability cultural worker who just blew me away um, in a talk for the Hastings Center was Yomi S. Wrong. And specifically the quote, I don't aspire to walk ever. 
I loved that so much. And um, I love uh, like the rejection of non-disabled whatever uh, stereotypes that a disabled person's biggest wish would be to walk. Um, I also really like Alex Hagard's um, notes on temporal inaccessibility, which I've been trying to figure out how to make uh, temporal accessibility a feature of my teaching. And so um, that was another revolutionary uh, writer just from the past year where I'm just so, I'm so grateful that the community is growing and is big and I'm like still learning. Um, and yeah, I, I'm always grateful for writers who are writing beyond Disability 101. Um, and so those are, those are just a couple people. Yeah. I love Alex Hagard's work and I did not know that Yomi Ron um, was writing. I, I really did not know that. And now I'm like excited to explore uh, more. And T, I'll turn to you next. Yes. Um, hmm. Well, obviously, I will start with people that's on this panel. OK. Um, and let's see. OK. Well, I feel like I had how I walked into this work um, and then later on rolled into it um, was uh, that I had the privilege of going to UW and they just so happen to have like a budding disability studies program there. And my last semester at UW, I happened to take a course with Ellen Samuels who just dropped a book called Hypermobilities. Shout out to Ellen, woo woo. Um, and um, sh like she deeply shifted how I see myself as um, disabled, um, how to like reclaim that word for myself and also um, peep me on game about Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which I wasn't diagnosed with at the time. Um, and actually right after I graduated, um, like literally three days later is when I received the diagnosis, which was life changing to me. Um, but I echo all the other um, uh, authors and writers, um, creators that you two have both listed so far. But I also think about um, stumbling across Mia Mingez and um, uh, the blog Leaving Evidence. Um, I think of the late Stacey Milburn. I think of Patty Byrne and Sins and Ballad and um, their disability justice primer, skin, tooth, and bone. Um, I think about Lexi Linez, um, who is a good friend of mine, but is also dropping a deeply um, personal uh, mad crip book called End of Abandon with me um, June 30th at Room One's Own. So look out for that. Um, and I also think about Alex. Um, Alice Wong and the Disability Visibility Project. Like all of these things helped me roll into my crip, um, mad crip politi political identity. And I would be remiss if I just say, when I say, when I say I refer to crip, I'm referring to because I learned it in academia and then learned later learned of Leroy Moore, I spell crip lowercase c slash capital K R I P because um you know there are just some groups that I respect so I changed that C to a K. Um, but yeah I would be remiss if I didn't um mention Leroy Moore um Jr. just really life changing um and like are are helping to shape who I am today. Thank you. And Leroy Moore is now, for those who don't know, actually studying for his PhD at UCLA, uh, which is uh, super amazing to know. Um, cool. So I have one more question for you. Um, and then I'm gonna open that up to questions from folks who are here. So if you've got questions for T, Saray, or Sai, 
go ahead and share them in the chat or on social media. And one of us is going to try to grab them and we'll try to ask at least a few of those questions. Um, my last question for you is, could you talk about what advice you would give to other disabled writers, whether aspiring writers or folks that are already deep in the trenches of uh, the agony of writing, the uh, stare at a blank page for four months and want to claw your eyeballs, but like you don't. Um, and then you write something and you show it to someone and you're hoping they tell you something good about it, but you're also convinced it's trash. And if they do tell you something good about it, you're convinced they're lying. Um, but like, what would you what would you share to other writers, whether they've they're already in that mess or they are hoping to be able to get through that mess to begin with? Um, what would you share? And um, we'll start this time uh, with Saray. The best advice I can give any writer is to find a time where you can reliably write. Um, it's practical advice. It's not always advice that people <laughs> want to hear. Um, but to me, the most important part about writing is writing. Um, you know, being a writer to me, it means that you show up for your writing. Um, and if you show up for your writing, your writing will show up for you. Now that doesn't mean it has to be every day. I don't believe in anything like that. But like, if you know that there's a Tuesday every month where you have 15 minutes and you write reliably then, then that's fine, right? Um, but um, I think that for many people, um, leaving it up to chance, it means that writing won't reliably develop. And I do think that writing is a craft. Um, it's a skill and it, like any skill or any craft, it has to be worked on. Um, so more than thinking about what to write, I would say making time to just go ahead and do it. Thanks. Um, I need to remember that too. Uh, feel personally attacked by this relatable content. Um, T, what about you? Hmm, I think something I didn't get to say earlier is that um, my writing is deeply spiritual to me. Um, uh, it's rooted in storytelling um, and the different lineages of spirituality that I have are deeply rooted in storytelling. So with that being said and how personal it is, I think writing is tender. Um, I think that you write for yourself and your writing will bring you community. Like just keep writing for yourself and your writing will bring you community if that's something that you're looking for. Um, and also um, know your boundaries. Um, just because you wrote something yesterday <laughs> or a few years ago, or even this morning, doesn't mean that it's re relevant in aiding you right now. And I'm focusing on you. How is this? Um, when I did Call Me Ill and Ellen You, um, I was recording myself through Mania, right? And then transcribing that. I needed to be able to check in with myself and make sure that I had a safe space when, when um, creating work so deeply personal and tender and maybe something I'm still going through, um, I think. And also that um, you are not obligated. Like you said, just because you wrote something and released it, right, um, doesn't mean you're obligated to say it 110. 10 times like there are some things in um call me ill some poems in left and some things in split i probably won't read on stage again um but that work is important that i i leave it there i just leave it there um and uh, i guess lastly is that um anything that you give or create from your experience is always a privilege for others to witness like you are you you know what I'm saying like what you share should always come from a consensual standpoint of yourself um like is you okay with it um and it's an honor to be able to witness and hold your word um so treat it as so and also um you get to be fluid in your writing um and whatever mediums that works for you yeah and Sai. Yeah, um, my my advice is who are your teachers or your mentors? I mean, I learned poetry from non-disabled people exclusively to my knowledge. 
In other words, no one disclosed to me that they were disabled. Uh, well, now I don't send work to non-disabled people. They're not my readers. So uh, my advice to young writers is just be aware of your first readers and their positionality. And I'm like jealous that T got to work with Ellen Samuels, for example, right? That just wasn't available to me. And quite frankly, it's probably not available to a lot of disabled people in academia and college because we're still getting in the door as professors. Um, so my advice is to find fellow disabled readers. This is Lydia. Um, yeah, I um, thinking about like, who do I let read my fiction? Um, I let any non-disabled neurotypical people read my fiction, like when I'm not ready to share it. No, I have not. I had to think about it. I was like, nope. No, I haven't. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. Like that, that speaks to me. Um, we've got a first question from Julia. Um, Julia says, for anyone, but maybe Saray first, as someone diagnosed autistic last year at 57 and a writer for decades and working with creating unmasked autistic texts, kind of, and as others mentioned, decentering a mythical general audience. I feel so incredibly behind in my understanding, but also so relieved to know who I am. And I want to convey this experience via writing. So my question is, how do you feel your writing emerges from an acceptance of your specific selves? And speaking to what Sai was just talking about, who do you show your writing to first? How do you accept or don't accept feedback? Um, well, I think with feedback, consider the source. Um, I went to Columbia for M MFA and I don't regret that in any way. Like Columbia came out of pocket for me in a way that was made it accessible for me. <laughs> and it's the only degree I have that actually paid for itself, um, truly. And so there's no regrets there. But the workshop experience for me as a trans person was abysmal. It was terrible. And, um, you know, people would ask me why my poetry was poetry, like they would say terrible things to me, um, terrible things, like things I can't even really repeat in polite company. Um, and, you know, like at the very beginning, I started feeling bad about my work, you know, and I was there to experiment. So like, of course, like sometimes it would be, I mean, I'm an experimental poet, I'm an experimental formalist, so my work is experimental. But, um, you know, they would have me feeling real bad about myself. And then I was just like, do I like their poetry? Is they, am I trying to read their poetry? Like, is that something that I'm invested in? Um, are they invested in my growth? Are they invested in me being great, right? Do they want to see me be great? Um, and the answer was no. <laughs> so I've, I had to stop considering it um, in any like serious way. Like it just stopped being important to me. As far as acceptance, I don't know. I think that to me, a lot of weight is placed on acceptance when like, I think that there are liberating parts about non-acceptance as well, like where it's like, I don't know. I guess I, I just think that acceptance, especially of an autistic self would be contingent on society treating us better than it does. And I think that like acceptance or like self-tolerance is like such a tall order in a world that like literally kills autistics for fun and sport every day. Um, and so I would, I wonder what the stance of Don acceptance is, like not necessarily of the self, but like it, a resistance of like what it means to be autistic in a world like this one. Um, yeah, I wonder what ref refusals are possible beyond like narrow acceptance. I think that's partially because I was an autistic child or like I had an autistic childhood that was diagnosed. 
um, and not diagnose like, oh, my parents are rich. And so someone took me to go be I diagnosed, but like I was deeply disruptive and a biter. And so it meant that I got a diagnosis coercively um, and went through ABA um, for my entire childhood. Um, and so I think that my idea of autistic acceptance, like, I don't, I don't really think about it, um, you know, in the sense that like, yeah, I'm autistic and whether I accept that in, or not is irrelevant to me. T or Sai, did either one of you want to weigh in on that question? And yeah, also echoing, um, the comment in the chat oh no, on ABA, so shitty. Yeah, like, fuck that. I'm really glad you were long past being out of that place. Uh, like, yeah, fuck, fuck that. Uh, but T or Psy, if either of you wanted to weigh in. T, it looks like you unmuted. Yes. Um. Yeah, I think, I think how I started this was, I don't, okay, it was, okay. Going to the, um, having the, um, educational experience I had first off I'm from I was born in Chicago but I'm from Madison Wisconsin so I ended up going going to other universities um outside in Iowa and then um and then a um a college in Madison and then I transferred into UW Madison it took me nine years to get my degree because um I just there was like a lot of institutionalization that happened and I was getting um I understood myself as mad, but then I also, my, my um, body was also, my mobility was shifting and changing and, you know. So anyway, um, so a lot of those experiences at the college that I was, the program that I was in, there was so much judgment, right? Like, it, are you good? Can you match up? I'm from the Midwest. Like, it's a lot of people from the coast. The coast get a lot of um, love. Midwest don't necessarily. And I'm not from Chicago, right? I'm not from Minneapolis, right? You know, these bigger names that people know about. No, I'm from Madison, right? And I'm from the hood. Um, and so... Um, I think what mattered most to me is that I needed to connect with other Black folks that could kind of understand what I was going through. Um, I couldn't just go around. Uh, I could say that I was mentally ill, but the access to, to words that we had wasn't. So poetry was that breaking ground, like that, like it just helped um, break open the conversations for me. So yeah, I guess I was looking for a acceptance but really I just wanted somebody to hear me um and um and and tell me that maybe they are going through the same thing um professionally now as I guess I'm a professional writer I don't know okay I write okay to save myself really um and I would say that when I ask for sensitivity writers or copy editors, some of those folks that I was most afraid of in my writing workshops in and outside of academia is the people I go to immediately to be like, can you read this, right? Am I matching up to um, the words? Like, am I coming off as an abolitionist here? Am I, or am I not? Okay. Okay. And if, um, if I'm not, then I need to change and switch up those words. So I'm like, I'm saying like, Maybe um, I would say uh, be clear about what you believe in. Find other people that will hold you accountable to that standard, and go from there. Like um, I'm not in it for the technical. I I had some access to it, but I break all the I break it all down now. So yeah, that's my advice. Thank you for sharing that too, Sai. Yeah, um, going back to the question, um, I'm later in life queer. I mean, my poems have been queer since the get go, but so I relate to the question of later in life diagnosed autistic through that lens, which I know is different. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. I'm, I'm, I didn't know I was queer until, or pansexual until I was like 36. And that's the challenge for me is accepting that or figuring out where my community is or how that fits. Or, um, I got to deprogram a lot of heteronormative bullshit and I'm still in that process. 
This is Lydia. Um, thanks for sharing all of your responses for Julia's question. Uh, we have um, another question from HC. This is a practical question. My shoulder slash arm pain from EDS, Ehlers Danlos Syndrome, has been so severe that handwriting and typing is very painful. I record and transcribe most everything, but it still takes text editing. Any practical advice? It's an open question. Yeah, I would say that like half of the time I have to record stuff because if my pinky didn't jump out of the joint, honey, then it's over. OK, so um, yeah, I don't I I would say that what I've mastered is, OK, I have a MacBook. I have that specifically because there are a lot of um, commands that I can program it to do. Um, and there's also, you know, from things, if I can only type with one finger, um, there are phrases that I put in there. Um, um, but I've also, I, I, at first I had a dragon, um, and now I use, um, which was really helpful, but now my Microsoft Word that I just got, I feel like that dictation is like really good. But again, I go through the accessibility module and I kind of um, adapt some things for me because it is, cause you just get a big old pages of run on sentences and that's a headache to have to like edit through. So um, things like, um, uh, taking a, a breath or a pause, or I can say a word that will, um, uh, signify it to kind of like break up the text for me. It's not perfect, but it helps out a lot more. Sai or Saray, did either of you want to add to that or seeing head shaking? Um, HC says thank you to T. Um, we have a question from Lucas who says, writing question for y'all, um, what form of writing have you ever wanted to try, but haven't? I'll answer that one. Two, form of writing I've always wanted to try, but haven't, graphic novel. I do a lot of art and a lot of drawing and a lot of writing, and I've always wanted to do a graphic novel. I've had a lot of ideas for it, and I have never tried it. Um, what about you all? Mm, I think um, like low key um, graphic novel is one of them, um, but I really would just like to like roll around somebody's life um, if they would let me, um, you know, like a queer, black, disabled person, you know, non-binary, you know what I'm saying, uh, someone like me. Um, and then I would like to... Um, you know, play okay with the silver screen. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I want to, you know, you know, I want to try my hand in that world. So I ain't did it yet, but I want to try. I want to interview uh, Dita Von Teese. I'm just going to manifest that into the universe because she's doing all kinds of inclusive uh, burlesque things, but not yet with disability. And so, yeah, I want to interview Dita Von Teese. May it come to be. Um, I don't know if there's a kind of writing that I haven't tried. I mean, there's writing that I've failed at. <laughs> like, I, I don't read fiction. I don't write fiction. Like, I think that when I was a young person, that was like one of the like questions on like the autism assessment is like, how well do you understand fiction? And I'm definitely the kind of autistic who does not. Like, I'm just like, why are you telling me this story? Why is this story boring? Like, why, what's going on here? Um, so fiction is definitely something I fail at, but I'd love to finish my screenplay about two rival bootleggers um, or like about um, a very pretty gay man in 1930s uh, Trenton who's caught between two rival boot bootleggers, one his boyfriend and one his wife. Um, and so that's my project at this time. Um, and I would love to shoot a web series 
um, I have, but I'm, I'm like in the midst of writing these things and I would love to, I would love for someone to be like, you can do a thing with this instead of knowing that it'll just like sit in my files for the rest of my days, because I think that they're good. Like I do, but like the, you know, I think poetry is good because, you know, you can publish it yourself if you need to. You can't really be like, I'm, I guess you can, but like, I feel like it's a lot harder to be like, I made a screenplay myself. Uh, this is Lydia. I am the opposite kind of autistic as you, Saray, um, where like I have always lived like in creating and building out massive, expansive fictional worlds and stories, but um, but I, you're not alone. You're really not alone. Like the majority of people in my life are also like deeply into fiction, but I've definitely met a bunch of other autistic people. Who are like, yeah, I just, I do not, I cannot. And I'm like, cool. I guess uh, you're not interested in reading my fiction, which is fine. Um, there's probably other people who are, um, but you know, I love that our neurodivergence itself like can just take so many vastly different forms and stemming from a lot of the same shit like in the middle of it but just shows up so differently um my last question as we close out this evening for you all is in thinking through your work as writers and that being a significant part of what you do um although each of you are in different places and you're involved in different kinds of projects in your lives um you know can you talk a little bit about how ableism has shown up in the writing community and literary spaces. Okay, I may have just thrown a bomb in in the last like five minutes, but I, I, I was like, but we gotta talk about it, right? Like, we gotta talk about this. So uh, I wanna go and start with, with T if, if you wanna share a little bit about like, what is this? What is this like? How does this show up? Well, I can't, I can, I can never separate my blackness from the ways in which my, uh disabilities manifest in my body mind so some things that i went through earlier was um uh being told that like the ways in which i talked about who harmed me naming folks that harmed me um that was an issue um the institutions um so and then i think also accessing some stages a lot of the times like i um thank you ty um so i think a lot of the things that i i have a problem with now is being literally able to access the stage like um not having any like access to like can i take the bus i don't have a wheelchair accessible vehicle um is it on the bus line um and then also or can i have access to this space to repractice and rehearse um, or put on my show that is within the confines of the city bus running um, to make that accessibility. And, um, and then also too, just like Madison is really white. Um, and um, the way that I show up in my presence, um, sometimes it's just not safe for me to access certain places at certain times. So yeah. I guess that's how it shows up. Hi. Yeah, I'm just going to flip it to internalized ableism, because for me, a, a really specific example and something that I'm really working on is the comfort of my own body mind. Like, why am I wearing my leg right now? Uh, you can't see the lower half of my body yet because I'm at a reading, I feel I ought to, but who put that there? Um, yeah. So it's like things like me kind of trying to figure out when I'm myself caught by ableism and I'm going to, one day I'm going to be more comfortable in my body mind. Um, but it, it's really tricky how, how, um, like how that ableism is inside me. This is Lydia. Internalized ableism is like its own bitch and a half. It's 
Yeah, um, it's a lot. Saray? Yeah, internalized ableism is a big one. You know, like, um, I think that more than anything, ableism has made it difficult to conceptualize what it looks like to be, or means to be disabled on the page. Um, and also limited the acceptability of certain, especially I would say in some ways, um, the way that physical disability looks on the page. Um, I don't think that there are many poets who are not also mad people. Like, I just don't think that that's like a common thing. Um, I'm pretty sure that like madness and poetry, it's just in the history of poetry, you know, like that it's like baked into the forms itself. Um, but I think that in terms of physical disability, um, it's hard to know where to turn. I like, I really love Lord Byron for that reason, like where like, um, Lord Byron really loved uh, Limpin Hero um, and like to talk about uh, occasionally mobility aids and things like that. And like, but like still so, and being a bisexual disabled dynamo in rhyme. Um, again, one of the benefits of being a formalist. Um, but yeah, I think that it's it's foreshortened my understanding about what it would even mean to be a disabled person on the page. Like what would it look like if I described certain aspects of my disability or aspects of my life on the page um, and limits the reception of that and, and um, kind of cordons off a very small readership or zone for that kind of poetry um, and for that kind of work um, and limits people's realm of understanding or realm of belief in its relevance even. Um, and I think that current shifts towards nominal disability without disability justice in literature um, do that process no favors. This is Lydia. Thank you for sharing all of, you know, your experiences and um, your struggles with um, all of the bullshit that we deal with, ableism, racism, white supremacy, like all of the fuckery that um, we have to struggle with that non-disabled neurotypical people just don't. And thank you also all for naming and centering disability and madness in our work. And um, for that reminder too, Saray, right? That so many folks who are creating cultural work have always been disabled, crip, mad, chronically ill people. We just don't name that. We don't tend to talk about it because of ableism. And I think that reminder is really helpful to a lot of us, especially when we're struggling with reconciling our desire and wish to create work and also the need under capitalism to have to survive and to pay to exist and not wanting to just always have to commercialize or capitalize off of what we're doing and also at the same time kind of literally having to um, on many levels in order to be alive and to keep being alive in a world that really often does not want us to be. So thank you again to all three of you. Um, so for all of you who joined us tonight, please join me in, in thanking T and Saray and Sai for joining us this evening, for sharing some of their work and their artistry with us. And thank you also, of course, uh, to both of our interpreters this evening, um, as well as to our captioner. Uh, we are always grateful for um, all of our communication and language access and support. And of course, a huge thank you to Nancy without whom our webinar programming would absolutely not be possible here at AWN. Uh, we hope that you will join us when we return after a short hiatus from our webinars. We will be taking a break for the month of June and we will be back in July. We will be announcing the details soon of our next Liberating Webinars event. And we hope that you will join us then. Have a fantastic rest of your evening. And um, please support T. Sai and Saray's work. We will be sharing all those resources with you. Thank you. <laughs>